Good evening. In fact, a very warm welcome to all of you who have, some of you have traveled very far from very far away and some very close. Of course, it's my particular pleasure also to welcome a few very special guests, among them the Prime Minister of Malta, the Honorable Joseph Muscat and the Premier of Nevis, the Honorable Vance Emery, and also several other senior representatives from the UNHCR and other institutions and companies we work with around the world who are joining us this evening and who are here with us today. It was nearly six years ago in 2009 when we actually had our last large event uh, in this ballroom, the Global Residence and Citizenship Conference we organize annually. And many of you actually over here vividly and positively remember a very great event we had. This was already six years ago. And now we are here again in this great venue and tomorrow we will have, I have no doubt, uh, because with these events you always have a very good feeling beforehand or you have not so good a feeling beforehand, but you know in advance very often how it will be. And I'm sure we have today and tomorrow, the whole day, a very good and excellent event. Now, for this evening, unfortunately, I have to tell you that we have two accumulation, accumulation of two uh, very unfortunate uh, situations. First of all, Ambassador Vazesha, who uh, was supposed to be here, he has been admitted to hospital two days ago, and it seems that he had to stay in hospital, very unfortunately, and so he's not here with us. Uh, Ambassador Vazesha, some of you know, is one of Switzerland's most distinguished diplomats who led over many years the WTO trade uh, negotiations for Switzerland and wanted to talk to us today um, from his particular, of course, very global perspective. Or very unfortunately, he's not here with us today, so I will have to uh, try to make up for that. We'll see what I can do. And also, I will see for this evening, as uh, many of you know, <coughs> we have a very special partnership with UNHCR and so I'm very pleased to welcome several UNHCR colleagues today but very unfortunately the second accumulation is that Alex Alainikov, the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner who also should have been here today unfortunately had a family emergency in Geneva and could also not make it. So I'm very sorry about that. We have, however, Daniel Andres here. He's the director of the UNHCR for External Relations, who will speak to us later uh, this evening as well. And uh, we will have a, a couple of uh, very, uh, I think, very important things to say uh, with regards to our partnership and what uh, the UNHCR does. And I'm very sure uh, Andres will uh, very well represent the UNHCR here. Um, so, basically, what I would like to do first is to step in to uh, replace uh, Lucio Sosesha. As I said, he has very big shoes, it's a little bit difficult for me, and I can't talk about world trade. I can talk about something else, though, and that is why do you actually need a second citizenship? Because that's, of course, the one aspect of the, the work uh, we do. And I had to think about that uh, a little bit, of course, what I'm going to talk to you about here. But I think, and I had to get something, you see, from home. And so I am, of course, a, a Swiss citizen, very Swiss. Uh, and I have a Swiss passport that looks like this, for those of you who don't know. And uh, a Swiss passport, uh, if you're born in Switzerland, you have one of those, is a very good document to have. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a well-respected country, and with this passport you can travel almost everywhere or to a lot of countries, and it's a safe home to return to. It's a pretty good life start you have if you have that. Um, but also you travel a lot, uh, so most of you, I travel a lot, and even if you're a Swiss citizen, yeah, you still have situations where actually you may need a second passport. How many of you uh, are dual or multiple citizens? Can you raise the hand? 
Oh, quite a few. Yeah. I predict in 10 years, it'll be a lot more. With a Swiss passport, it's great, but I went to Vietnam a few years ago where I need a visa as a Swiss citizen. And I had to hand in my passport to the Vietnamese embassy in Bern, and it was lying in Bern for a little bit too long. I had a flight planned for a Saturday, and by Friday, my passport wasn't back. Now, what to do? If you don't have a second travel document, second passport, you're not flying. It's that simple. Luckily, at that time, I had another passport. I had a passport of St. Kitts and Nevis. And with this passport, I was able to travel to Singapore on Saturday while my passport was still in the embassy and on, I think on Tuesday they couriered my Swiss passport with the Vietnamese visa to me in Singapore. So I actually could travel. If I did not have that, I would have to wait. This is just one practical example where even as a Swiss citizen it is very practical, simply practical and convenient if you have more than one passport. But what if, if you, let's say in Vietnam after I came back from Vietnam, I had also a Vietnamese passport and with a Vietnamese passport, with this one, this is one of the worst passports, it's in the lower fifth of our global visa restrictions index and with this passport you can hardly travel anywhere. You need a visa everywhere. Suppose you are a citizen of a country where you need visas almost everywhere. Then it becomes almost a necessity to have an alternative passport, an alternative citizenship, uh, because if you're a global citizen and you travel around the world and you have just a Vietnamese passport, it's a problem. It's really an issue and there's a lot of people around the world that have that issue. Um, and some uh, have the luxury to be able to invest and then acquire residence or citizenship status in another country and then they can also enjoy more travel freedom. But it can become more serious than that. I happen to also have a Danish passport and the Danish passport is a little bit like the Swiss passport, it's a small neutral country and with the Danish passport you used to be able to travel all around the world, very respected country and no problems anywhere. But I'm sure all of you remember that some time ago uh, there were some cartoons published in Denmark, in Jelland's Post, and which a week later a major Cairo newspaper took up these famous Mohammed cartoons. And within less than a week, as a Danish citizen, you couldn't enter about 15 countries in the Middle East. The Danish embassies were set on fire. As a Danish citizen standing in a queue at the airport, you were attacked. And suddenly, if you just had a Danish passport and needed to for travel, business, leisure, family needed to go to the Middle East, you had a problem. Before it was great, suddenly you have an issue. That can be even more serious. American citizens, British citizens, they are today all exposed. They are very exposed in large parts of the world due to various geopolitical developments that seem to only get worse. We will hear more of that today, of course, from a completely different angle with the global ref refugee crisis that has also basically created um, and is continuing to create a further and increasing problem from a completely different angle. But as these problems around the world grow, suddenly with one passport it might be good today, it might be not good tomorrow. And that is the same thing when you have just a passport from Denmark or from, from the United States or, or like that. What do you do? Huh? So how can you uh, increase your travel freedom? But of course a lot of people, and you I'm sure are aware, a lot of people they have citizenship from countries where maybe they already from their stability in the country, or as I said before, uh, in Vietnamese citizen uh, needs 
basically needs a, a second citizenship. Or at least it is necessary to have access to maybe Europe or to a, uh, another uh, travel area in North America. And so, for example, the minimum one can do is to acquire a residence card like this, for example, in the EU, where together with the Vietnamese passport, you have a very good access and certain security that also uh, people want. And so that combina combined with a good uh, passport is already a solution. But what you really need, and I think what most people don't realize and, and increasingly um, is an issue, is that what really secures these global citizens' uh, international movement and also security is really an alternative uh, passport, an alternative citizenship. And I believe that that's very much the future, not just because it's our business, but actually it's, I think, a global trend. Now, how do you get that? There are, of course, multiple avenues. If you're not born uh, somewhere uh, or you marry uh, a person of certain countries where you acquire this easily, you have to essentially live in a country for uh, some time. Or you can acquire uh, citizenship through some form of an investment program. And I also happen to have a New Zealand passport as I have lived in New Zealand some time, years ago, so we have this. And of course if you have a life circumstance or a possibility to live in a country for a while, for example in New Zealand, you can live five years. And if you live five years in New Zealand, you can walk away with a New Zealand passport. That's of course very good. But most people, particularly the busy global citizens that we take care of, they have no possibility to ever think of just living somewhere for five years just for that. And it is for those people where increasingly it's important to have programs available. And likewise for countries to attract those people where they can make a different kind of contribution to the country than living in a country. They can actually invest their money and talent to, in return, become a citizen.